Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. It's that time again. As ever, we are waking up with watches, and everything you see on the screen is for sale. Reach out to me directly, tmasso at thewatchbox.com, for questions about anything you see on this show. Prices, extra photos, boxes, papers, accessories, trade and sale proposals. Everything's on the table, including the watches on the table. And remember, names, prices, and reference numbers in the description below. Let's get started. Alango Unzona never disappoints. And back in 2015, there was a 200th anniversary to be celebrated. 40 millimeters in platinum. This is the exquisite Alango Unzona 1815 FA Langa 200th anniversary. 200 pieces in platinum. The watch is 40 millimeters in diameter by 8.8 .8 millimeters thick and simple. Part of the 1815 collection. It features a lovely black galvanized sterling silver dial and as you can see white gold hands with a lovely alpha fashion and black polish. The timepiece is simple with vertically arrayed Arabic numerals. The signature of the 1815 family. Flip it all over and you can see the Manual wind, 50-hour power reserve, caliber L0511. Beautifully executed and hand-finished. You have a freehand engraved half-bridge, black polished cover for the escape wheel. You have a black polished swan's neck regulator. It does have hacking seconds. And as you can see, it is a simple and handsome movement with an elaborate three-quarter style plate in that golden German silver or nickel copper zinc, the copper giving it the golden hue. Throw this watch on the wrist and it wears as a thin dress watch should. Compact, flat, flush, nicely poised and handsome, and sports casual, if you will, because the combination of the black dial and the white metal case means this one doesn't feel as inherently dressy as a colored gold timepiece would, but rest assured, in platinum, you feel the quality of what's sitting on your wrist. That 200-piece limited edition gives way to, well, a timepiece that's limited simply by the number of craftsmen who can build it. Launched in 2013, this is the Alango Unzona 1815 Retropont Perpetual Calendar. A timepiece 41.9 millimeters in platinum. You feel how special this watch is. Now, the dial is also made of sterling silver, and if you get real close, you could see that the moon phase display is made of solid gold, white gold in this case. There's a power reserve indicator up and down at 12 o'clock. You have a split second chronograph that allows you to time two concurrent events such as cars around a track or runners around a course. You have the moon phase, you have the perpetual calendar, and quite brilliant, there is a pusher adjuster at approximately 1030 on the dial that adjusts everything in sync. So if you fall a few days behind, you use that one adjuster and everything steps in coordinated fashion. Split seconds chronograph, perpetual calendar, moon phase, and power reserve, and all of that courtesy of the 631 part caliber L1011. As you can see, the split second system employs a second column wheel, and there are pincers over the Retropont bridge, and those act in tandem with a decoupler system that prevents the stationary seconds hand from dragging on the still mobile hand. This is a rare and expensive system, uncommon on split-second chronographs, featured only on the best of the best, and that's what this assuredly is. Now we will resynchronize the hands and take a look at the lateral clutch and the second column wheel assembly. You can see that the primary clutch and column wheel acting on a fully jeweled clutch mechanism. You can see jewels rather than bushings used here. You have freehand engraving, yes, on the half bridge for the balance, but also on the root of the yoke for the chronograph. Note the steel satin finished components, the elements that are black polished, the elements that feature mirrored bevels on their edge, both the bridges as well as the levers, horns, and recentering hammers the yoke of the chronograph, all of that with blued screws, German silver bridges and plates, and it is a monstrous watch. Not because it's overwhelmingly huge, but because you feel all that platinum on the wrist, and you're just in awe of the level of complication. Not just how intricate it is, but the fact that every engineered component in the case is also finished artisanally, with no compromise to art or science.
When I do Rolex on the show, I prefer to do it watch or watches that are not terribly common. So when I do a sub or a GMT or a Daytona, I try to pick offbeat versions. But the standard Explorer 2 is an unusual watch in either of its dial forms these days. You just don't see the 42 millimeter steel Explorer 2 as often as you see the big three. And that's a shame because this watch is gorgeous. Not only is it 42, but being only 12.3 millimeters sit thick, it sits low on the wrist. The 12.3 millimeter thickness is about the same as a Daytona. That's your reference. And you can see on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it is a comfortable flat and flush watch with an elegance thanks to its aspect ratio that is uncommon in the Rolex catalog. You can see down the barrel, this is a watch that sits low and though it is broad across the wrist, I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 15 centimeters circumference. Chronometer, dual time in 12 and 24 hour format and 100 meters water resistance. This one's also beautifully loomed both the 12 hour and 24 hour format. And I would even go so far as to say, with the bigger dial and the bigger watch, it wears the Cyclops eye with greater elegance. The Cyclops eye doesn't quite monopolize the dial here the way it does on the 40 millimeter and smaller watches. Okay, now we're getting truly uncommon and truly special. This blue dial beast was a one year only Rolex GMT. This is the 116719 BLRO. This was the Pepsi bezel white gold model in 2018 and only 2018. Remember, from 2014 to 2017, the watch was a white gold Pepsi bezel with a black dial, but because a new Pepsi on a steel Jubilee bracelet debuted in 2018, Rolex wanted to set its flagship GMT apart. And so the white gold watch for one year only featured the old 116 designation and the caliber 3186 movement, but with a new blue dial. And that combination of 116 reference and 3186 movement with the blue dial was discontinued after the one year 2018 in favor of a newer movement in a watch that was now called 126719 meaning this is a one year only GMT and that's about as surefire a collectible as you can get in the world of Rolex moreover because everyone wanted the Pepsi and steel on the Jubilee bracelet that year and this watch cost tens of thousands of dollars more very few people ordered this watch in the one year it was available but it has all of the virtues of a GMT the ceramic insert and the bi-directional bezel, the ability to read three time zones, 100 meter water resistance, a chronometer certification. This one with the Oyster bracelet is also a little bit more burly and butch than the somewhat effete five link Jubilee, which is graceful and elegant, but not quite as solid as the three link design on the wrist. And as you can see, this watch, uh, just over 12 millimeters thick, is nice and flat. It can be your dress watch. If you're wondering about paying that much money, it's the collectability, but also the versatility of a watch that can not only be your only watch, not only be your most collectible watch, but easily be your sports watch and your dress watch. Go swimming and fly to boot. Remember, the first owners of this watch back in 1954 were Pan Am pilots for whom the model was originally designed. That said, if I could pick just one Rolex from this show, it would be this guy right here, the Tridor, an absolute legend. This right here is the 18239, technically a white gold reference. The Tridor was launched during the 1980s with a unique proposition, though primarily a white gold date date. 36 millimeters. It was the fusion of three different golds. These are not like the later Tridor bracelets, which featured different metals in different links. This is fused rose, yellow, and white gold in the center links. They have been fused together with no overrun, overlap, or blending. The industrial capability of Rolex at its best, something no other brand could do, no other brand would do. And of course, you have the President bracelet with the crown clasp showing you the point of partition, otherwise a very clean and low profile arrangement. Now what you're going to note here is how sharp the shoulders of the bracelet are. This watch looks as sharp and clearly defined and immaculate and full of volume and form as the day it left Geneva. This is late 1980s E-Series, a timepiece with a lovely golden sunburst dial, set gems in baguette and brilliant cut form. Of course, it's a chronometer. Of course, it's a double quick set. And you can see another mark of the freshness of this case, not just the sharpness of the lugs and the bracelet shoulders, but also the fluted bezel in yellow gold. You can see it's as sharp as a sparkling cut gem. 
Chronometer, 100 meters, of course, twin lock crown, as you can see, in white gold with the double dots. Throw it on the wrist, an absolute pleasure and privilege, possibly the most interesting Rolex of the 1980s and one of the rarest Day-Date references of all time. Get one in this condition, and you're talking about something that is almost unique, the most iconic of 1980s Rolex Day-Dates. And after all, the Day-Date was the watch of the decade in the 80s for Rolex. This would be my choice. I'm not necessarily one to go for gems, but when a watch is this intact, this rare, this special, right down to its original tritium gem set dial, my heart beats, it flutters, and quite frankly, it's stolen by this entirely charismatic complication from Rolex, what was then and is now the King Kong watch in the line. That said, if we are to start a new tradition in mixed metals, it may as well be the Snowflake Gold, also known as the Golden Snowflake. This was launched in 2018 as the Grand Seiko Spring Drive Automatic SBGA 259, 41mm in grade 5 titanium. This is the successor to the 2010 SBGA well, later SBGA 211, originally SBGA 011. Identical in every regard except for the yellow gold hands logo, date aperture, and indices on the dial. This is a timepiece that represents the best of Grand Seiko. The distinctive snowflake dial is anything but an aftermarket nickname. That is the name its creators bestowed upon it. In northern Japan, when the snow falls, it creates this ruffled flourish atop the snowbanks, the drifts, the mountains of northern Japan. You could see how it's very lightly rusticated with dips and troughs and peaks and valleys, and it does in fact look like blown snow across the dial of the watch. Now all of the indices, the hands, the logo, the aperture for the date, you can see they are faceted and hand finished on micrometric milling tools by artisans who just create these components and do nothing else. The hands, the indices, all the dial furniture hand finished. The case held directly against a spinning tin plate, manually finished by eye-hand coordination, the so-called Zeratsu black polish. You're used to seeing this on screws, regulators, caps of Swiss movements, but never on a component the size of a case. This watch is hand-finished inside and out. You can see the bracelet titanium to match with the deployant clasp, and through the case back you can see the spring drive movement. Accurate to plus or minus 15 seconds a month, it combines the best of quartz and mechanical. There are no stepper motors, there are no capacitors, there are no batteries. All the energy is supplied by the spring, converted to kinetic energy, that is the motion, and electric energy. A small induced current created by the unidirectional governing wheel. That, like a balance on a Swiss watch, is the regulator, but because it only moves in one direction, speeding up or slowing down by means of the induced magnetic field, you can see that the seconds hand is completely smooth, no staggers, no stops, no jumps, no alternations, and this is a distinctive trait of spring drive. Once again, watchmaker made, watchmaker regulated, and when the time comes, watchmaker overhauled and returned to your care. This is a lifetime movement in a handmade watch, not just the lifetime of the owner, but the lifetime of the watch designed to outlast you. Now, of course, the 100 meter water resistance makes it appealing as an everyday watch, and in feather light titanium, you can see how it wears across the wrist. This case, derived from the 9S family, has a nice cambered, almost tunnel-like curvature to it. Feather light on the wrist. I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference. It is gorgeous. A true handmade watch with a distinctive Grand Seiko technology. Power reserve indicator and three-day power reserve. Grand Seiko is an underrated brand, and for a house that is technically part of the traditional Holy Trinity, so is Vacheron Constantin, and this reference was launched back at SIHH in 2004. Now this is the Malt Chronograph reference 47120 in white gold, and it represents the ultimate alternative to a Patek 5070, with which it is mechanically almost identical. A sizable 41.5mm white gold case, you can see there's a stepped flat plane 
lightly conical bezel. The lugs are what define this watch, and you can see they are beautifully fashioned. Vacheron's unique aesthetic tradition is its Baroque lug forms. Everything from these malt-style lugs to cowhorn or corn de vache to claw-style lugs. You can see that right here we are talking about welded case construction with the lugs created separately and then welded to the case with all evidence of the welded joint between them removed to create that sharp break. The case all of high polish and graceful. The chronograph pushers shouldered for bolstering and then a lovely guilloche cut almost like a curtain from top to bottom with an undulating wave. Sunken sub registers for constant seconds and chronograph minutes and you'll note half frosted broadsword hands for easy reading. The chronograph can be used in conjunction with the telemeter scale outboard distinct from a uh, tachymeter. Tachymeter gives you speed, telemeter gives you distance and you use it in conjunction with the chronograph. Originally created for field artillery in the military, you can use it for anything that represents a speed of sound at sea level type of timing situation. And then you just use the calibrations and the chronograph seconds to gauge how far the report was from your location. White gold indices and radially arrayed Arabic numerals. The real fun is on the reverse side where we get Vacheron caliber 1141. Now Vacheron has done a lot to modify the basic Le Mans 2310. Remember, this is the great movement originally designed in the early 40s that became the Omega 321 and as such went to the moon and later became the Vacheron 1141 and the Patek CH2770. The basic La Magna movement is stately, handsome, and evocative, but Vacheron finishes it to the state of the art. The first thing you'll note is that the balance, which is adjusted in five positions like a chronometer, has an overcoil hairspring rather than the standard flat hairspring of La Le Magna. You'll also note there is a small golden rod from the half bridge of the balance over to the adjacent bridge. You can see that little twig-like protuberance between the two surfaces. That is a hairspring guard, something rarely seen. You'll find it on old 60s Rolex Daytonas. It's designed to prevent the overcoil from doubling up on its own coils or from getting hooked on the regulator assembly just above. A rare and extravagant refinement that I'm happy to see because it represents blue sky thinking on a watch that's otherwise a dress timepiece. Vacheron is thinking about shock. Now you can see the watch features a lateral clutch and a column wheel. The column wheel with black polished cap and black polished screw at its center, actuating steel levers, horns, chronograph yoke, and as you can see, there is also a recentering hammer array, and all of that steel has been satinated on its top with mirrored bevels, and you can really see them on the edges. So not only are the bridges all mirrored on their edge, so too are the chronograph components. All screw heads have been black polished, and you can really see that to good effect. So too is the swan's neck fine adjustment mechanism. Handsomely executed with perfectly arrayed, if spare, Cote de Genève. It also features an engine turning on the base plate. 48 hour manual wind power reserve and 18,000 vibration per hour beat rate throw this one on the wrist. Comfortable, but substantial. As you can see, a 41.5 millimeter watch is anything but a shrinking violet. It's a fairly large dress complication. And with the lugs, you can see it stretches to over 50 millimeters across the wrist, meaning this one has a lot of presence. I wouldn't recommend it for a wrist smaller than 14 and a half centimeters circumference, but you will note that it is still flat, flush, and easy to ship underneath a cuff. So it's very much a dress timepiece, but it's a bigger and bolder example. And if this were a Patek 5070, it would cost twice as much. We've spoken of Grand Seiko, which is an up-and-coming brand, and we've spoken of Vacheron, which is sort of a brand on the comeback trail. A brand that came out of nowhere in 2017, Bulgari. Now, to be fair, Bulgari has been making watches since the first quarter of the 20th century, but it wasn't until 2000 with the acquisition of Gerald Genta and Daniel Roth, followed by a mass buying spree of case makers, clasp makers, bracelet companies, companies that build hands and dials, that Bulgari became a true haute de gamme manufacturer. 2014 witnessed the arrival of the Octofinissimo automatic, or I should say, manual wind ultra thin, and that manual wind gave way to the automatic that you see here. It's important to note that the automatic arrived in 2017. In between, we saw an ultra-thin tourbillon and an ultra-thin minute repeater, making the Octo Finissimo not just GPHG laureates, as this watch won the GPHG men's watch prize in 2017, but a fully fleshed out manufacturer model line, and now a design icon for Bulgari. As you can see, the timepiece is a 
array of curves and creases in juxtaposition, only 5.15 millimeters thick by 40 millimeters in diameter. It's also only 46.5 millimeters lug to lug, meaning quite easy to wear. A double knurled crown features a ceramic cabochon, and the dial is made of a lovely media blasted material to match the steel example you see here. So this is the steel model that came out in 2018. I mentioned the Octo Finissimo arrived in 2014, then came a tourbillon, then came a minute repeater, then came the automatic, and then came the steel automatic. Remember, it was originally released in titanium. What makes this watch special is not just that it's more substantial, if just as thin in steel, it's that the steel is flashed with rhodium, palladium, and gold to create a shimmering luminescent surface that belies the base material. This watch looks like something special, and indeed it is. Everything's media blasted, so there's no satination. It's just a gentle, glowing, frosted finish. Now, you can see inside the bracelet is a clever countersink so that you actually wind up with a clasp and bracelet combined that's only as thick as the bracelet. There is a recess inside of the bracelet that allows the clasp to sit flush, and you can see that to good effect there. When you close it, it sits inside the bracelet. Therefore, the clasp and the bracelet together only as thick as the clasp or the bracelet alone. Let's pop it open and take a look at the works inside. Caliber BVL-138. I'm going to do my best to get you some light here so you can better see it. Now, this movement is manufactured 2.23 millimeters thick, over 36 millimeters in diameter, beautifully made, a combination of manual and mechanical finishing with an extravagant platinum micro rotor with ceramic bearings for high winding efficiency in spite of the open case back vista. Center rotor automatics give you better efficiency, but they block the view. Micro rotors give you a better view and a thinner movement, but they're generally inefficient. Ceramic bearings and platinum fix that problem. Now the movement again, over 36 millimeters in diameter, 2.23 millimeters thick, and remarkably with a 55 to 60 hour power reserve, no compromise. Throw it on the wrist, it is incredibly flat. You really get a sense of just how flush this watch is. It sits under your wrist hair and easily glides underneath the cuff. It's sporty enough to be an all around watch, though you would think of something ultra thin as a dress watch the dress watch ultra thin is Piaget's domain. Bulgari is creating something that can be worn just about all the time, save in the water, and there is now a 100 meter water resistant version of this watch. So I would just about say Bulgari's got its bases covered. That said, of all the variants available, this is visually the most spectacular. And yes, that includes the rose gold model. F.P. Jorn seems to get a lot of play on Watchbox's various channels, and while I'm not personally a collector or enthusiast of the brand, I have to admit that if there's one brand that's been on the rise for the last two years, it's Jorn. A year ago, maybe even just eight, nine months ago, if we spoke of the strongest brands in the business, we would have said Patek, Richard Mille, and Rolex. Now. F.P. Jorn belongs in that discussion, perhaps even surpassing the coveted status of Richard Mill timepieces, and it's the older Jorn models, like this Octa Zodiac, that represent the most sought of the most sought. 40 millimeters in platinum. This watch is often mistaken for part of the Ruthenium series. This watch was actually made from 2003 to 2005 in 150 examples, and it's remarkable for a couple of reasons. First, it's part of the Brass Movement series, and it's a limited edition. Limited to 150, it features the pre-gold movement version of the 1300. So prior to mid-2004, F.P. Jorn movements were made of brass with silver rhodium plating, and that's exactly what we have here. Gold might be more valuable from a commodity standpoint, but the brass is more valuable because it is less common. Now, as you can see, individual numberings and a special reference Z, 150, and this is number 62. You'll also note both the French and the Swiss hallmarks here, as well as the maker's mark of Eleanor of Paris, the case maker for F.P. Jorn until roughly late 2008 when he bought the company and moved it to Geneva. So you've got a discontinued limited edition model, you've got a discontinued Eleanor case, you've got a discontinued brass movement, and all of that with the 40 millimeter case size that was less common in the early days of the F.P. Jorn manufacturer. Remember, Jorn officially serially producing watches under his own name from 1999. Today, he makes 900 watches a year. Back then, it was far less, making this watch a rarity. Amongst the production of the day, it was a scarce piece, a special piece, and it remains an uncommon complication. 
For all of the discontinued features and facets of this watch, it is the Zodiac calendar that is perhaps the most interesting, as the watch features a quick set for both of its primary functions, the Zodiac calendar as well as the date. 120 hour power reserve, in fact the watch will run for almost 7 days, 120 hour is the chronometric power reserve, a handsome watch with a lovely white gold dial ruthenium coated, it is a special timepiece that looks unlike anything else FP Journe has ever made. So if you're interested in the Journe brand, which is really a brand on the rise right now, it is the early, the limited edition, the watch that could be considered vintage or exceptional that are the most collectible and which will remain the most going forward. So this is the Octa Zodiac, a personal favorite of many collectors. That said, I'm not so into astrology. I'm more into motorsports. And for motorsports fans, at least in the world of Journe, it does not get any better or more exclusive than the Santagraph F. This is a watch that was inspired by Jean Tot. Now, Jean Tot, who was the general manager of the Ferrari F1 team and later president of the FIA, he challenged Epi Journe to create the 1 100th of a second chronograph, the Santagraph, back in 2006. Again, he spurred a development in chronograph design at Journe by submitting a can of Ferrari racing red paint to FP Journe for a very limited series of Santagraph models. Now, because a portion of Santagraph sales was going to a spinal injury research, this was a passion of both Journe and Jean Tot. So the model you see here, featuring that Ferrari racing red, as you've seen on the Scuderia's own cars, this is a scarce piece. Less than 20 were made, meaning that even given the rarity of a Journe timepiece, remember, between 600 and 900 made a year, this is a true exotic. It's also a little bit more handsome, as you can see the array of colors, black, black polished steel, red off-white for the numerals and indices, yellow for the hands at center, but a lack of tachymeter scales on the individual register, which makes these registers look less crowded than on the standard Santagraph. Now you can see the 1 100th of a second foudreon, 100 fractions of a second, and Santagraph, that is where the name comes from. You also have a 20 second register, and then you have a 10 minute register, the smallest of the three. Now the watch features a patented reversing rocker system that allows you to get Mono pusher elegance, but with twin pusher stop start capability. You don't have to reset when you start. Now, the watch has an 80 hour manual wind power reserve that is curbed to 24 when it's running, but remember, the largest register is 10 minutes, so you don't necessarily need to keep the watch running. You do so for the spectacle of it. Full platinum bracelet, which, if purchased separately as a $50,000 accessory, I recommend you buy them together. Now, when you pop that platinum bracelet open, you can see the inside of the watch and the movement is spectacular. Now there are two patents in this watch. One was for the rocker system that operates the chronograph and the other was for a system whereby the chronograph is driven off the arbor that is the axle of the barrel and the time of day is driven off the toothed edge of the barrel. So the barrel is symbolically as well as practically located at the center of the movement. That's impressive. Now you can also see that the movement is made of rose gold. I mentioned that briefly during my discussion of the Zodiac and this watch right here is a platinum watch with a platinum platinum bracelet with a 18 karat rose gold bridge and plate movement, meaning it is exceptionally hefty on the wrist. You truly feel the quality of this timepiece. The sense of occasion is tangible even with your eyes closed. Not only is it a rare piece, a special piece, a GPHG laureate, and of course closely associated with the Ferrari Formula One team, but this is one of the scarcest modern independent brand watches you will ever encounter. Again, less than 20 produced. That said, if I were to show you the most interesting watch on this show, the watch I most desire, the watch with the most whiz-bang, gee-whiz features, it would be this. Launched in 2014, this is the Ball Engineer 2 Magneto S. 42 millimeters in stainless steel, this watch is loaded with fun. Let's start with the basics. On the dial side, you have tritium tracers. This watch features little glass capsules that contain a phosphorescent material and radioactive tritium, a beta emitter. It's not dangerous, but because it is self-activating, you don't need to charge this loom in light. Leave it in a dive locker for a year, pull it out, in the middle of the night it will still be glowing. Now the watch also features Ball's spring lock system, which we will demonstrate momentarily is located, how did I do that? Well, you're going to find out, is located around the hairspring. The spring lock system, which you'll note is 
being advertised on the case back, encompasses a cage around the hairspring. So this is designed to protect the hairspring from deformation and reduce timing deviation due to shock and concussion on the wrist. That means even if you're doing crazy things with your watch, playing golf, tennis, batting, firearms, marksmanship, or Ball likes to mention, drumming with Kiss, and yes, that was tested, this watch is going to lose far less time and suffer no damage compared to conventional watches with the same movement. Now, not only do we get spring lock, but this watch, which is 5,000 G shock resistant, also features a chronometer certification, but that's not its coolest feature. Nope, none of those are its coolest feature. Take a quick look on the case flank. You see that clear window? Now do you see the white filling? That is your on the wrist gauge for the A-proof system. 1,000 Gauss anti-magnetic thanks to a Moo Metal alloy iris. You can see your movement or you can render it 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic, the same as a Rolex Milgauss. And you get a little bit of Stargate style action. And if you've seen Stargate, I don't need to explain. This watch is loaded, 100 meters water resistant, tritium tracer dial, 5,000 G shock resistant, COSC chronometer, and Milgauss with the most entertaining caseback display of all time. And that on a fairly basic Salida SW200. This is an awesome watch. And it features an almost indestructible Kodora strap that's probably gonna last you 10 years on the wrist at least, making this remarkably wearable and versatile watch one of the most durable timepieces you can buy at any price. Think of all the proprietary tech and refinement you're getting with this ball, and you realize that for the low 2000s price range, there's probably nothing that's more interesting. Heck, there's probably nothing that's as interesting. But if you prefer bronze, Bell & Ross might have a solution for you. This is the BR0392 Diver Bronze, launched in 2018. The watch is 42 millimeters by 42 millimeters by 12.6 millimeters thick, making it surprisingly thin for what it is, a 300 meter water resistant diver. Let's hear the bezel. That is one of the best in the business. I'm gonna put that up there with Rolex, Doxa, and the Panerai Luminor Submersibles, which I consider to be the standard in the industry. Line up that luminescent pearl with the minute hand. Now you've got an impromptu zero to 60 minute timer, which I prefer to a chronograph. A lovely blue dial, fully loomed with rose gold plated individual indices and hands. There are two types of bronze, it seems. Bronze that is yellow and bronze that is a little bit more copper orange, copper red. And this one has a lovely reddish tone. I prefer this look on my bronze watches. Now, as you can see, it's it's also a limited edition, 115 out of 250, with a lovely case back decoration and a 40 hour automatic inside, which I believe is a Salida SW300. Now, as you can see, the watch wears easily. 51 millimeters lug to lug. The case is made by GNF Chatelain, which is one of the finest case makers in the business. Bell & Ross, part of the Chanel empire, and Chanel owning Chatelain. Bell & Ross is the lucky beneficiary of that relationship. One of the reasons Bell & Ross cases in all materials are among the best best detailed and best built in the industry. And again, this is a way to go if you don't have a ton of money to throw at your watch itch, you can scratch it with this Bell & Ross BR0392 Diver, which includes a lovely matching and oversized Bell & Ross pin buckle. The watch comes with little tools that allow you to change the strap too, using the hex keys that hold the strap to the case. But if your dive budget is a little bit more deluxe, you might want to consider the Blancpain Ocean Commitment 3, 40.3 millimeters in stainless steel and launched in the year 2018. This is a special series watch, one of 250 made, that gives you a muted satin finish and a smaller case. A lot of folks think that the polished 5015 is just too extravagant. And well, it certainly is the Cadillac of dive watches, but this watch right here featuring the same sapphire capped, fully luminescent bezel, the same case shape, the same handsome profile from all angles, and inside, similar mechanical refinement in the form of caliber 11. 
1150, which is both free sprung and blessed with a 100 hour automatic winding power reserve. You also get the same 300 meter water resistance with this Ocean Commitment 3 limited edition. And as you can see, it features a vintage inspired dial that is a little bit more evocative of the 1950s and 60s era of the 50 Fathoms than the standard 5015. Throw it on the wrist with this factory navy blue NATO strap and you can see that it wears quite nicely and easily. This is a handsome watch and a comfortable one. It sits low. It's only 13.3 millimeters thick without the NATO strap underneath. So if you want to wear this one with a cuff or you have a smaller wrist, this watch, which features a blue dial and a blue bezel, is a wonderful solution. It's even a watch that has contributed its share to maintaining our world as 1,000 euro of the original purchase price went to ocean conservation charities. Actually, I think it was one thousand Swiss francs because this is a Swiss watch after all. A really handsome mid-size Blancpain 50 Fathoms for the traditionalist and one of the great modern 50 Fathoms references. Let's hear the bezel. A little bit more refined with a more pronounced glide but just as pronounced with its 120 clicks compared to the Bell & Ross. While I enjoy the 40.3 millimeter case, I do like the full fat version of the 50 Fathoms. And this example is one of the best launched in 2019. This is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Nageur de Combat, a timepiece dedicated to French combat swimmers who in the early 1950s through Bob Maloubier and Claude Riffaut ordered the original 50 Fathoms watch from Blancpain. It was a commission for combat swimmers and this is their qualification pin. 300 piece limited edition frosted and polished case back. The entire case, 45 millimeters, and steel is satin finished and you can see here you have the hex keys holding the retaining bars for the strap the 40.3 millimeter watch you just saw uses spring bars the bezel looks great with the sapphire cap and it sounds just as good now you can see the dial is special, the case is special, the case back is special, it's not all of high polish like the standard watch, and the dial a little bit more vintage evocative, less printing. As you can see there are printed indices and different hands designed to evoke the original 1953 Nageux de Combat commission watch. But under the case back, free sprung with a three day power reserve, you still have the caliber 1315 which is both incredibly accurate and incredibly shock resistant with that long power reserve. On the wrist comfortable. Only about 50 millimeters lug to lug. I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 14 and a half centimeters circumference. Let's do a loom shot. In fact, let's do two. Okay, to the right you can see the Ocean Commitment 3. To the left you can see the Nageur. These are awesome, circular supernovas. Thanks to their sapphire capped bezel, the entire bezel can be painted with loom with no danger of flaking, scratches, or scuffs. That was worth the wait. Okay, we're closing in on a big finish, but we're not there yet. Launched in 2017, many will say that this is the best version of the 5396R. The Dash 014 blue dial, rose gold hands and indices, rose gold case. 38.5 millimeters. You can see this annual calendar, which need be adjusted only once a year during the jump from February to March, is a lovely Patek complication in a Calatrava style case. It's Patek's original invention, the annual calendar, with Patek's original design, the Calatrava. It's equipped with a full deployment clasp, and as you can see, the case back is quite handsome. A lovely caliber 324, beautifully hand finished, as you can see, with a anti magnetic silicon hairspring, six position adjustment, and the Patek Philippe seal, 35 to 45 hour power reserve and Patek guarantees it to run no worse than minus three plus two seconds per day. A very impressive timepiece inside and out. If you wish to up the ante, you can do so with a watch I consider to be one of the stars of Basel 2014. This is the 5961A, white dial, opaline white, not silver, but truly white, with blackened white gold indices and hands. It's beautifully loomed. It's an annual calendar with an AM-PM indicator down at 6 o'clock. It features 
not just a chronograph, but a flyback chronograph. And if you look carefully up at 12 o'clock, a power reserve indicator. So you have the flyback chronograph, the AM PM indicator, the annual calendar that needs to be set once a year, and you have the power reserve. 40.5 millimeters in stainless steel. The watch originally bowed in platinum in 2006 with Patek Philippe's first ever manufacturer automatic chronograph caliber, the 28520, which is in this watch. It's a vertical clutch and a column wheel as well as a flyback with a 55 hour power reserve. And as you can see on the wrist in stainless steel and beautifully loomed, easy to read day or night, this flyback chronograph annual calendar power reserve is an all-arounder and possibly the most interesting steel Patek watch you can buy. Forget the Nautilus, forget the Aquanaut. This gives you more inside and out and greater rarity as these were only made for approximately four years prior to discontinuation. And if you turn the watch over, you can see it is beautifully executed inside. It has the same margin of accuracy as the caliber 324 we just saw. And you'll appreciate that the level of finishing is uncompromising with the same silicon anti-magnetic hair spring free sprung gyro max style architecture but the addition of a vertical clutch and a column wheel for actuation meaning if you wish you can leave this chronograph running full time without hazard wear or tear to the movement oh and how much do you love that they loomed the power reserve hand that said this would give the 5960-1A, a real run for its money. If I were to pick a watch, cost be damned, from our three Pateks, I would be at an impasse between this and the one we just saw. This is the 5370P, the best Patek launched in 2015. Platinum, you could see that it features extravagant evacuated and relieved sides with white gold cabochon at both ends. There is a coaxial split second trigger inside the crown allowing you to split the seconds on a dial that is black grand faux enamel. The rarest of the rare, even at Patek. There's a tachymeter scale outboard, Breguet Arabic numerals in white gold reserved for special pieces at Patek. And take note, the hands at center are loomed. This is a loomed watch. The column wheel feel is one of the best I've ever experienced, easily vaulting it into the top three in my entire experience dating back to 2014. Now, as you can see, the watch is special. Being 41 millimeters and relatively thin, it belies the complexity that lies within wearing comfortably thanks to the downward sweep of its short cropped lugs. Very few watches have the gravitas on a comparatively simple dial that this one does. The combination of the Arabics in Breguet fashion, white gold applique, grand faux enamel, loom, and that white on black printing, evocative, charming, intoxicating. Turn it over and things get even better. This is the successor to the old Lamagna movement, Patek's CH29535. It does feature hacking seconds, take note. It also features two column wheels, a chronograph bridge. Let's take a quick look at how all of this operates. You can see that there is a lateral clutch that is fully jeweled. There is also, as you can see, a second set of pincers at the center, and it too features the decoupler as on the longa that I mentioned earlier. That is a premium feature that you will find on this Patek. Also note the forest of stems and springs, as well as the level of finish on top of the second column wheel. 65 hour manual wind power reserve, six position adjustment, Breguet over coil hairspring, and a free sprung gyro max balance. 65 hour power reserve again, despite the four hertz beat rate. This is a combination of the best of everything. Note the black polished cap to the column wheel. And the watch does feature as if you just zoom back five seconds on the video, you could see the Paul jumping system, the Paul base jumping system for the instantaneous jumping minutes display. This watch has it all, and it features a full platinum deploying clasp. You know me, I like to finish with a big piece, and they don't come much bigger than this. Launched in 2011, this is the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Concept Flying Tourbillon GMT. As you can see, we'll get close to the dial, there is a flying tourbillon with no upper bridge to block your view. Unobscured by an upper bridge, you can fully enjoy that Audemars Piguet Renault et Papy crafted overcoil hairspring as it beats way at 21,600 vibrations per hour. You can see there is a function selector, as with Richard Mule watches, after all, APRP, which builds this watch, also builds the pieces for Richard Mule. Now I'm in winding mode, now I'm in setting mode, and you can see the watch cycles from neutral to winding 
to setting. The watch also features a GMT indicator over at three o'clock, so you have your day, night, and a sapphire rotating disc that gives you that second time zone capability. But wait, there's more. This 44 millimeter watch features a lovely media blasted and brushed titanium case with a scratch resistant ceramic bezel. All of this on top of a caliber, caliber 2930, that gives you twin mainspring barrels for a 10 day power reserve. Not only is it hand finished in the finest traditions of Audemars Piguet, Renoe Papi, watchmakers to the gods. But this is a watch that's also fully loomed on its dial side and 100 meters water resistant. Does it get any better than this? Well, if you love the ultra haute de gamme and you prefer not to pay for Richard Mille's name, but go straight to the source of the finest RM complications, I recommend this. Holy Trinity design, no nonsense beat down sports watch durability, flying tourbillon, multifunction crown, 10 day power reserve and a secondary time zone, and all of it can go swimming. This thing rocks. Email tmaso at thewatchbox.com for your questions about buying any of the watches you see here. Remember, everything you see here is for sale on our website. Reach out to me directly, and names, references, and prices are in the description below. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.